Sunday to you all. It is March the 29th. It is a beautiful day today in Jefferson City, Missouri. And, and uh, I say that because there's a, a lot of folks that tune in from a lot of places. And so we want to welcome you this morning. God's peace and love and grace to be upon you in these, well, these unusual times. And so as we gather together here somewhat remotely, we still gather together as church. So if you are home gathered together, I pray, uh, with family and maybe friends, maybe you're someplace even at work, uh, looking on a computer screen or a phone or a tablet, we welcome you this morning. I would like to remind you that uh, I'll go to our website, and on our website is a bulletin with announcements and information for you to stay uh, plugged into. Our newsletter is there as well, important information for you there. Uh, also for our children, there's a Sunday school lesson that is uploaded there, a little button for it, and uh, you can take a look at that and do most of that work right there uh, on the internet. That's to help you parents out uh, in these times as well. Uh, there's also a Bible class following this time. If, if you're streaming with us on Facebook, uh, it'll come at 10 a.m. this morning. If you're watching this video uh, on our website on YouTube, uh, I believe the Bible class is just below me by the time uh, you see this video. We're glad to be together. Even in these strange circumstances, it is still an opportunity uh, for us to come together in the very presence, uh, the very people, and the gifts of God. Uh, one announcement just to reassure you is, is uh, uh, because of the new uh, restrictions and the guidelines given to us uh, by those that, uh, that know a great deal about what's going on, uh, we're going to suspend uh, communion for the next two weeks. Uh, we were offering that on Sundays and Mondays, and for now, uh, we're going to restrict that now just for the sake of the, the virus and, and being safe. Um, but we will find a way uh, as we go forward to continue to supply God's people with this important uh, and necessary gift as we go along. As we celebrate being together, uh, let's celebrate right now and let's sing our first hymn, hymn number 752, Be Still My Soul.
begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us make a profession of our faith this morning in the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find those on the screen here next to me. We confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Recognizing that we gather today all over the place in the very name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are made aware of who He is, what He has revealed Himself to be, and then that reflects on who we are. We are fallen, rebellious, broken people. And so we have an opportunity to make a confession of our sins at this time. And so I'm going to use these words that we've been using regularly each time we gather. And if you'd like to speak those words, or if you'd just like to hear those words and affirm them in your own hearts, let's make confession of our sins now. Please hear my confession, O God. I, poor sinner, plead guilty before you of all sins. I have lived as if you did not matter. And as if I mattered most. Your name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. I have not let your love have its way with me. And so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been spoiled with sin. Forgive my sin, O God, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. My church, I want you to reflect upon this confession that you've just made. To recognize that there are times in the past week where you and I have rejected our relationship with God. We have rebelled against His expectations for us and His commands for us. And I want you to know that because Jesus came, lived, suffered, and died for you, and on that Easter morning, burst forth from that tomb. Because of Him and Him alone, your sin, my sin, all of it, is completely and totally forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, our first reading comes to us from the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 38, begin with verse 4, where God answers Job's complaints. Pick it up at verse 4. God says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes to us from Romans chapter 10, beginning with the fifth verse. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. 
But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel comes to us this morning from St. John, the sixth chapter. And if you'd like to, where you are at home, why don't you stand right now out of respect for Jesus and his word? We pick up in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. They were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We invite you, if you're standing, be seated. Uh, for our next hymn, hymn number 765, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. That everything here, Lord, all the technology would continue to work so that your word may be proclaimed. That your people, wherever they are gathered, would focus and lean in to hear what you have for them this morning. That these words would go out and, and be effective. And Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us as, as the sheep are spread out. But Lord, they are still part of your flock. Remind us of your power that you have no boundaries. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God's grace, God's mercy, and God's peace to you. From God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Now, if you'd like to have a, a Bible with you, it's not uh, a bad idea to have one. Maybe even something to take notes on. There is a, a bulletin with an outline on the website. I filled it in already for you, not trying to make it easy for you, but it's kind of hard to do two things at the same time. So um, I invite you to just participate as best you can where you are. You know, it's often a welcome invitation for someone to invite you to go for a walk. And so this morning, I would like to invite you to figuratively come on a walk with me. Now, the Bible is many things, but one of the things it is, is it's an, uh, a collection of incredible walks. The very first walk in Genesis where God would come down into the Garden of Eden and walk with the first man and woman in the cool of the day. Now most of the time it is God inviting us to go on a walk with Him. Like that difficult walk of Abraham and his son Isaac up the mountain of Moriah. Or that supernatural walk of Moses and the Israelites walking where the Red Sea once stood. Or then the very long 40 year walk of Moses through the wilderness with those same Hebrews. Or that victorious walk of Joshua seven times around the city of Jericho. Or the disciples' very revealing walk on the road to Emmaus, the day of Christ's resurrection. Or Saul's, soon to be Paul's, interrupted walk on his road to Damascus. And then there's that walk that is so sad and so holy that it has its own name, the Via Dolorosa, where Christ walks carrying his cross to Calvary. But quite possibly the most incredible and miraculous walk that has ever been witnessed is today's gospel reading where Jesus walked on the water and invited Peter to come out and join him. Now, the incredibleness of Peter's walking was not what he was walking on, but instead whom he was walking with. He was walking with Jesus, his Lord. And so again, this morning, I want to invite you to take a walk this morning. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 will begin on verse 24. Now, this miracle of Jesus walking on the water appears in Matthew, Mark, and John, our gospel reading. But Matthew has the most details. So here's a, a math problem on a beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. Twelve disciples get into a boat. One gets out. What's left? The answer is boat potatoes. That's right. Boat potatoes. Unwilling, unmotivated, fearful disciples are left in the boat. Now let me be clear about what I want to challenge you with this morning. Don't be boat potatoes. Because there are no water walkers in that boat. Now, if you need something to be a bit more familiar to our point, don't be a pew sitter. Don't be passive. Don't be uninvolved. And church, don't be afraid. Because there is a cost to staying in the boat. And that's growth. This story is not just a miraculous story. It is also an invitation, I believe, to get out of the boat. Now this takes place after a miraculous feeding of several thousand people, remember, with just a few loaves of bread and a couple dried fish. We talked about that last week. And Jesus goes away by himself and he prays and he sends the disciples in a boat across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum without him. And then somewhere in the wee hours of the morning, during the fourth watch, it says, that's somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning, Jesus comes out to them walking on the water. Now, after a 
predictable response from certain to be superstitious fishermen, Peter asks Jesus to join him. Matthew 14, verse 28, he says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, this is important. Peter asked for an opportunity, not a guarantee. You see, when we consider walking on the water, it's best to ask Jesus for an invitation into the unknown rather than assurances. Because that is not how God works. Now, Peter in the scriptures is often the first one to speak up. Perhaps it's because of his personality. Maybe it's his age. Maybe it's his standing among the other disciples. But here he demonstrates that the walking on water requires more than just courage. It requires wisdom. Peter often struggled in this area. Remember when he was on the mountain with James and John, the transfiguration of Jesus and Moses and Elijah appeared. He said, we should build structures so that we could stay here. Or then in the upper room, we will celebrate here on Monday, Thursday, very soon, where Peter hears Jesus talking once again about his impending death. And he stands up and says, that's never going to happen on my watch. And Jesus says, you are being influenced by Satan, Peter. Or then when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter whips out a sword and lops off some poor servant's ear. Here Peter wisely asks for an invitation. It's shaped by, I believe, what he's come to believe about Jesus. And for us, it's important for us to know who's calling us out onto the water to venture out of our boats. Because, church, it is possible to make, to make courageous, high-risk decisions that are dumb. And so this to you this morning, calling all water walkers. The only way that can happen is to get out of the boat. For Peter, it was about doing what Jesus is doing. He was walking on water. That's what we as a church claim to want to do. To join Jesus in what he's up to. Whatever he's doing. And that often includes getting out of the boat. It's more than just talking about getting out of the boat. It's more than saying, I believe that I could walk on water. You see, information alone is not enough to create, create courageous humans. This is the problem often in churches where people are lifelong church attenders or lifelong Bible study attenders. If all the person does is learn what they're to do as a Jesus follower but never do it, they'll never walk on water. They are boat potatoes. You see, church, actions are required Acting on what you're being called to do. It's like a, a trust fall. Trust fall where someone stands there and, and another person behind them and they get rigid as a board. Sometimes they cross their arms over their chest and on a command they fall backwards trusting the person behind them to catch them. Now you can trust the person behind you is capable of catching you. You can trust that they're willing to catch you, but until you actually fall, you have not acted on those beliefs. Eleven disciples that night spent the rest of their lives talking about what might have happened. Only Peter accepted the invitation and did the amazing. For us, church, this may take the action of tithing, trusting that God will provide when we sacrifice a tithe to Him. It may take the form or the action of confessing a secret sin to God, one that you have not confessed yet, trusting that God honors those that tell the truth. This action for you might take 
the form of risking a conversation with someone who needs your encouragement or perhaps your apology. But when you're considering getting out of the boat, be patient, but not passive. See, it needs to be God that's calling you out of the boat. You go where Jesus already is. And I'll be the first to admit, we as Christians are not patient people. Many times I think we're double espresso followers of a decaf Jesus. I mean, how many times does the disciple Matthew use the word immediately in this account? Listen to this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Jesus immediately said to them, or immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. That's Peter. And even though God is always at work, he is patient. He does have a plan. He asked Abraham to be patient about an heir arriving. He asked Moses to be patient about arriving in the promised land. He asked Simeon to be patient to see the Christ before he would die. He asked the disciples to wait and be patient in Jerusalem for the gift of the Holy Spirit. He asked Paul to be patient for heaven. And he asked us to be patient for his return. Revelation chapter 20. He who testifies to these things. Yes, I am coming soon. And so while we wait, church, what do we look for? We look for Jesus being at work. We look for Jesus working around you. When a neighbor comes up to you in these times and says, I don't understand how God could allow this to happen, this outbreak. Jesus is at work there. Get out of the boat. Or when a co-worker asks you, aren't you a Christian? Jesus is at work there. Get out of the boat. When someone notices your bumper sticker or your t-shirt or the artwork hanging in your home or in your office, Jesus is at work there. Get out of the boat. Or when someone says, you're busy and tied up at this time on a Sunday morning, why is that? Jesus is at work there. Get out of your boat. Now this doesn't mean that the next time you take a run to Walmart for toilet paper, that you stop someone in the parking lot pushing a cart and say, come here, look at what's on my bumper sticker. Now, do you believe in Jesus? It means pay attention to where God is at work. Pay attention to where Jesus is already at work and then get out of your boat. But church, getting out of the boat is scary. Dealing with the things we're dealing with right now is scary. So let's talk about dealing with our fears. Now in this story, I've often mused about why Peter was afraid. Now when you see Jesus walking on the water, clearly the laws of physics are already inoperable. In Mark chapter 14... It says, but when he, that's Peter, saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. So we have Jesus walking on the water here. And then shortly thereafter, here's the picture of what Peter may have witnessed. Even water walkers struggle with storms on occasion. We all have faced, are facing, or will face storms of many kinds. And God will call us many times to face those storms because through those storms, He grows us. In fact, these words of us, Isaiah come to my mind. Keep these in mind in the coming days and weeks. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You see, it says the weapons will be formed. Storms will disrupt our lives. Viruses will spread. 
And these difficulties will threaten our faith and our trust in God. He never promises to remove all of them. But he does promise to use them. Notice that Jesus calls Peter out of the boat, knowing that Peter will sink. Jesus didn't walk on the water in the calm of an afternoon. He came to them around 4 a.m. in the morning. You see, church, we learn things out of the boat, among the wind and the waves, that we cannot learn anywhere else. Does that sound familiar with where we are right now? Church, fear, it's the number one reason to stay in the boat. Fear is the common thread among all boat potatoes. In fact, do you know the most common statement of God in the Bible is do not fear. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do you know how many times he says it in the Bible? 366 times. That's one for every day of the year, including leap year. God is good. And we need not fear when he calls us to get out of the boat because he's there. And so you and I, we are in a constant battle as followers of Jesus between fear and trust. And which one wins depends on which one we feed. I'll give you a little sociology information here. There's two laws at work with us every day of our lives. The first one is the law of cognition. It's a fancy word. It basically means your thoughts. And it says that whatever you think, you become. If you focus on the scary things of this world, if you have a regular steady diet of news broadcasts, if you read everything that is posted on Facebook, if you listen to those things and see those things, those represent the wind and the waves out on the water. And you will tend to be afraid. Then there's the law of exposure. That basically says that what we expose our eyes and our ears and our minds to, we tend to then be shaped in how we see this world. And church, that fear will keep us in a boat. But I want you to know that we can use those two laws to defeat the way that Satan intends to use those laws. See, you and I, we can spend time in the Word of God, our law of cognition, and let that fill us. Memorize Scripture. Let it be part of you. Recite that Scripture when you are afraid so that the things that you expose yourself to will strengthen and encourage you. Listen to Philippians 4. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Church, that's why we send out morning coffee. That, that's that acronym for Christ offers forgiveness for everyone everywhere. A, a morning text that says, here's some encouragement. And if you've been receiving those, you realize those verses have been about anxiety and fear and the confidence that God grants us. We have those Lenten devotionals. They're on the website. You can read those. They encourage us. When we do read and reflect on a regular basis, that's to be in the Word of God so that that law of cognition and exposure strengthens us and doesn't hurt us. Church, here's what I found. Fear spreads. You see it in the news. We hear the hysteria and the gossip and the posts of, of people, the general mob mentality now, fear spread among those disciples at 4 a.m. on the Sea of Galilee, that early morning encounter as they saw the very first water walker. But fear is not the only thing that spreads. So does trust. That's the power of water walking. You see, trust, trust is infectious. Trust is contagious. 
And that's why we must tell our stories of when God has been faithful, when God's blessings have been so clear, where God's power and presence have been demonstrated in our lives. Church, that's why He reveals those things to us, so that we can tell others. And so church, in closing this morning, where are you in regards to the boat? Are you curious about what water walking is like? Maybe you have your hand on the side of the boat wondering if this is even possible. Are you peering over the side wondering what that would feel like to do the miraculous? Or are you fixing your eyes on the very first water walker? In Isaiah 40, 31, let me close with this. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So church, whether you are soaring or whether you're running, maybe right now you'd be good just to be walking. Wherever you are in regards to your relationship with God. If you want to walk on the water, you have to get out of the boat. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. At this time in our service, we often collect our offerings and our tithes. I want to encourage you where you are at home. Don't neglect the spiritual discipline of offerings, sacrificing our tithes and things to God. And let it be something that we try our our best to try to create normalcy, even though we are far apart from one another. But let this be one of those things that continues, that we put our trust in Him. This is one of the ways we demonstrate that. We just become joyful givers, and it's trusting that God will provide us with everything that we can. Now, I'd recommend that for the time being, probably just sending it in would be best. Drop it in an envelope and send it up here to church. But we are around during the week. It doesn't hurt to have a person or two stop by. So if that's what you'd want to do, I certainly wouldn't mind seeing part of my church. We recognize God's incredible goodness as he shares his blessings with us. Let's have a time of prayer. A couple of the things I'd like to pray for this morning. Um, one is a prayer of thanks. Uh, Pastor Kanipa uh, has made it down to uh, Naderland, Texas. Uh, down to Holy Cross Lutheran Church, safe and sound. Uh, he shot a, a video, I think I saw, uh, last night, and uh, sitting in a brand new office filled with boxes. And, uh, and so his, his adventure and his calling begins again uh, down there and uh, under, again, strange circumstances. But uh, people need, uh, need a shepherd, and I'm thankful that he is there and, and ready to roll. I also want to pray just generally uh, for many of the people that are sick uh, because it's not just the virus. This, this is added on to normal life. And so we want to pray for people that are dealing with cancer, different treatments, uh, dealing with surgeries, impending surgeries. We praise God for, for new arrivals of new births, uh, for Stephanie and John Eddie uh, with little uh, Jordan. And uh, we thank and praise uh, God for the, the new addition. We look forward uh, to a little... Stephanie and John call him JJ, uh, going to be added to the family through the waters of baptism. Uh, we are thankful that God's church uh, is not restricted by walls and, uh, and that we gather together. Following our prayers for the church, I uh, will pray the Lord's Prayer. I invite you to bow your heads. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that your church is gathering here, even though it's uh, electrons across the internet, Lord, it's still your spirit connecting us all through the gift of faith, through the gift of, of fortitude to, to commit ourselves and convict ourselves to be connected. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing to extend uh, out to your church, uh, to be able to touch and bless and continue to stretch and use our people uh, to be instruments of your love and compassion to uh, fellow neighbors and co-workers and, and people around the state and around the world. Lord, I, I thank you that uh, Pastor Kanipa is safe and sound down in Texas, and we pray for your blessing upon his ministry. 
Lord, I pray for people that have traveled due to, to cancer treatments and things that are going on in their lives and for surgeries and for new births and for people that are facing surgeries and recovering from surgeries. Lord, I pray for our seniors that are shut in and, and cut off in many ways from many of their family members and, and people. Lord, I pray that this time passes quickly for them so that we can come back together as church. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the leaders of our country and our state. Continue to bless them with wisdom and discernment. Lord, I thank you that when the decisions are made well and, and good wisdom and is used, Lord, we shouldn't notice much happening in our community, and that's a good thing. And so make us those that are, that are not so vulnerable to this virus to be sensitive and compassionate to those that are. Help us to follow the rules follow the guidelines and do it patiently, obediently, and lovingly because that's what you call us to do. Heavenly Father, bless us as your church at this time that we would learn new things about who you are and your provision. Bless us with strength and fortitude and, and again conviction. Heavenly Father, all these things we ask in the name of Jesus who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. And so church no matter where you are. No matter where you're seated. Receive the blessing of God to you now. May the Lord bless you. And keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's conclude our worship here in this place. Hymn 722, Lord, take my hand and lead me. Mm -hmm. 